you know, we've mentioned and other people have mentioned there's so much focus on uh, Palestine and Gaza, and rightly so, but we've been trying to do better about uh, illustrating a lot of the suffering going on in other parts of the world. Um, one of those parts, we recently did a piece on the, Con uh, on the Congo, and Sudan is also facing a famine of Ethiopian proportions, if any of you remember the Ethiopian famine in the 80s. Um, so this is Mark Anderson. Sudan's famine is already on par with Ethiopia's in the 1980s, The Economist reports. If fighting continues until early next year, more than 10 million people could die from starvation and related diseases by 2027. And here's another. Many in Sudan are wondering why there are constant protest marches for Palestine in London, but nobody ever says a word about the war in Sudan. One year of war has caused 15,000 killed, 230,000 kids risking starvation, and 8 million refugees. The Forgotten War, and they're absolutely right. That's part of why we're doing this segment. Um, okay, so this is a bit of video of the conditions that some of the Sudanese are living in. Moment in time, we need to see urgent humanitarian action and support here and for the future, because we expect more and more displaced people to arrive in this area. I'm here in Kassala State, and we're visiting a school that's housing 70 households who have been newly displaced from Sinjab. The conditions are quite appalling. There's no water at all. There are four shared latrines for the entire displaced community. When the community needs to go bathe or cleanse themselves, they go to the canal and or get water from the village, however the water is contaminated. Right now, the community is eating beans and sorghum, so no vegetables. We met with a woman who delivered a baby while she was uh, being displaced, and she's having trouble breastfeeding because she doesn't have access to the appropriate nutrition. We need urgent attention now to support the communities here that have been displaced. Right now, they're being supported by the host community, but the host community is also struggling because they're running out of resources. This is a charity trying to help their mercy corps. And uh, this is from PBS. This Sudanese woman's tears expose the brutal reality of forgotten war and starvation in Sudan. Selective sympathy is a cruel injustice. Every life should matter. All eyes on Sudan. So we'll take a look at that clip. Who's made it here with her baby and toddler. The fighting is very intense in our area. There's no food there. We have nothing to eat. She's at the very end of her strength. Her eyes glazed, she sits, staring. A brief moment of rest before they have to move on again. We're sick, hungry, and we have small children. We are so tired of this war. We won't survive. Living like this is so very hard. So just uh, terrible circumstances that these people are living under. Um, so this is from NPR. Um, so there's a famine, but they're not declaring a famine. This is a bit of bureaucracy that's really maddening when you get into the details. Is there famine in Sudan? This month, a group of United Nations-backed experts looked at the data and, and concluded the answer is yes, but no official declaration of famine has been made. In the 1980s, a series of devastating famines struck several countries in Africa, including the infamous famine in Ethiopia in the mid-1980s due to drought. Estimates are that some 1 million people died in Ethiopia alone. The Ethiopian famine inspired the We Are the World song that raised millions. It also eventually led to an effort to come up with a common definition of what constitutes a famine to help governments and humanitarian groups take the necessary actions. 
That system of figuring out whether a famine is happening or not is called the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, or IPC. The assessment is made by a team of independent food security experts known as the Famine Review Committee, backed by the United Nations and other international aid agencies. According to the IPC, the threshold requirements for famine are one in five households face an extreme lack of food, malnutrition rates among young children are at 30%, and in an affected area, two out of 10,000 people are dying every day of causes not related to trauma. In the case of Sudan in 2024, the ongoing civil war has decimated the country's food supply. The Famine Review Committee looked at data collected from Zamzam Camp in North Darfur in Western Sudan, where over half a million people are sheltering. Quote, in Zamzam Camp, we had data that confirmed the acute malnutrition threshold for famine had been passed and that the mortality threshold had nearly passed as early as January, says Lark Walters, a decision support advisor at the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, which is part of the Famine Review Committee. That January data is now nearly eight months old, Walter says, but it took until August 2nd for the famine assessors to analyze and reach a concession, consensus and publicize their findings. Quote, it is important to recognize that famine can only be confirmed after many deaths occur and mortality rates reach extreme levels. And so government and humanitarian actors should really never wait until a famine is classified to mobilize the resources available to stop it, Walters cautions. In this particular case, there has been concerns for several months now. We all saw this coming. Aid groups such as Doctors Without Borders, as well as the United Nations, told NPR that things have reached a breaking point. They have heard from sources on the ground that people are boiling dirt in water as a last resort to ease the hunger pains of children. Eyewitness sources have also told them that people are selling their children to be married with the hope that they can use the payment for food or giving their children to armed groups to serve as soldiers in return for money. Meanwhile, since April, when the fighting escalated, both sides in the Sudanese civil war have been blocking humanitarian aid. Each side does not want supplies to reach their opponents. And because the country is now in its dry season, people can't grow their own food. The scientists and data analysts who issued their report this month say what needs to come next is political action. If a country has a functioning government, the UN asked the government to issue a declaration of famine. It's a system that is intended to respect the sovereignty of the nation. But in 2024, well, that would be a first. But in 2024, the Sudanese government has repeatedly denied the existence of famine. The country's UN representative stated at the Security Council that they don't believe the data. Humanitarian groups are now saying that the U.N. should step in and make a declaration of famine. The U.N. says it's up to the internationally recognized Sudanese government. In particular, food security experts are calling for convoys of trucks to bring food and nutritional support, not only for those who are malnourished, but for those who are on the brink. The World Health Organization says 8.5 million people in Sudan are at emergency levels of food insecurity, one category away from famine, according to the UN-backed definitions. And there has been progress this week. The Sudanese armed forces agreed to open the Adre border between Chad and Sudan following talks in Geneva. On Thursday, the World Food Program said a convoy of more than a dozen trucks delivered grains and other supplies to about 13,000 people in western Darfur. The WFP said it had more supplies for 500,000 people that are still awaiting permission from Sudanese authorities. Aid groups said this was a good sign, but a trickle of what is needed to help the population in Sudan. Quote, I've seen some estimates of up to 4 million people would die, 
said the UN's Justin Brady, referring to calculations made by global groups who predict how many people will die of hunger based on available calories and population size. So it is going to get quite grim here. Now, I want you to imagine if this were happening in France. What if this were happening in Germany? What if this were happening in Japan? It's not only racial. It's also how we categorize countries, how we categorize peoples, whether we think of them as one of us or one of them. The people of Sudan, yes, partly because of their race, but also because of how we class them economically and culturally. They're not one of us. Right. These are the things that happen if you're one of them. You're out right. there. You're not in the family of nations as we define that. So you hear about these just absolute horrors, 4 million people starving, 10 million people starving, and and you're caught up on a on a bureaucratic snafu about whether or not you can declare famine. Would they do that if this were Germany? Yeah, right. Would there be a bureaucratic snafu that would keep them from bringing food if you had 4 million starving Germans? Absolutely not. And um, yes, Sudan is ignored because all of the focus is on Gaza, um, just as Yemen was ignored. And that's partly the fault of the media. And that is also partly the fault, frankly, of podcasts like ourselves. Uh, we were not nearly the size that we are now. Uh, but that was that was still going on when we first started. Um, and yeah, these stories tend to get neglected. Unfortunately, part of it is that shows like ours are dependent on better financed media for our stories. We, we don't have money to send a news team right. to Sudan. And if they're not covering it, we're not covering it. Um, But that's not to excuse it away. There are sources out there. You have to make a point of going out there to find them and to platform these stories. And that's part of what we've tried to start correcting with the Congo story and with the Sudan story. And that's something we will continue to do uh, because these people are certainly no less worthy of our attention than the Palestinians. Yeah. And here's a point. You know, we spent a couple segments on this show talking about how, you know, the working class in this country, in the community of nations, in the first world, uh, are be, are being squeezed and are being deprived. And then you have a whole nother level right. of deprivation and immiseration out in the quote unquote rest of the world. OK, so when you add up. The rest of the world, which, as Russ just said, yeah, we just write off. Well, yeah, that happens in places like Sudan, places like Ethiopia, right. places right. like Rwanda. What are you going to do? Right. Right. That's just right. written off. Then right. you have all of the deprivation in it within the, you know, quote unquote, advanced nations in the developed world, the first world. So you add those numbers together and you have to ask yourself, hey, who exactly is benefiting Yes. From this world economic system? Like, it's actually yes. very, very, very few people. There's actually yes. a tiny handful of people when you add everything up, right? Because we don't even think of, we, you know, you, as you said, in our discourse, we don't even think of the poverty in Sudan, which is, you know, there's a civil war there, obviously. So this is, you know, and, and you know, this is especially uh, critical at this time. But it's not it's nothing of a different kind than an overall status quo in which more than half of the world population just doesn't seem to matter. There's a great I forget who said it. we we actually covered their speech. It was actually uh, this actually came from a surprisingly horrible person who said a, 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 actually a pretty uh, based and insightful thing. Was it Fiona Hill? I, I want to say it was, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I don't recall. But we we read a speech a while back. From someone who made the point that, like, um, who we consider the rest of the world is actually most of the world. Most of the world. Like, actually, where the rest of the world. Like, most of the world is what we write off as the rest of the world. Well, and you could just carry that on through to, uh, what is it, like 20 people are holding most of the planet's wealth or half of the planet's wealth. Listen, you know, people ask a lot, what do we believe? What do I believe? Really? What do I really believe? Uh the future of humanity 
It's revolution or slavery. That's what I believe. I yeah. believe we're either going to have a revolution that overthrows our current uh, economic and, and power dynamics, um, or we're all going to wind up slaves that own nothing and are told to be happy about it. That's Here. what I think the future is. You know what we is. could do? We, 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 we could put it this way. This is, a, this is a way that everybody will understand. See what happens, Larry, when you fuck a stranger in the act. There you go. I think that I think that says it up. I think that says it. I think that I think that gets to the essence of it. Yes. Please clap.